Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Luisa Palacios. I'm a senior research scholar here at the Center on Global Energy Policy of the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. I am uh, delighted uh, uh, to be here alongside with my two colleagues, uh, um, Mauricio Car Dr. Mauricio Cárdenas, who was a former Minister of Economy or Minister of Finance and Minister of Energy of Colombia, and uh, most, uh, my most recent colleague and the most recent distinguished visiting scholar of the Center on Global Energy Policy, Mr. Juan Carlos Jove, who had a, a very interesting career, uh, uh, just uh, finished his mandate as the uh, Minister of Energy and Minister of Mine of Chile. So um, we thought that what we will do today is have a conversation among the three of us uh, of the impact of the Russian invasion of Ukraine in Latin America energy markets. Um, and I think it's good to set the context. Uh, you know, this Russia, uh, this is already a, uh, sorry. Uh, excuse me. This is already a crisis that has led to significant um, and severe economic, political, and social uh, uh, impact. Um, but in addition to the humanitarian crisis and the refugee crisis that we're seeing, uh, the worst in uh, in Europe since World War II, um, there is a uh, a devastation uh, or significant stress caused uh, by supply on supply chains, uh, uh, which were already. Uh, disrupted because of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and you know more stress on global commodity prices, which have been already uh, under pressure since uh, since last year. Uh, Russia is not any uh, uh, country; it's a uh, huge commodity exporter. It is the second most important oil exporter in the. Um, Global markets is the second uh, 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 exporter of uh, petroleum products. It is the uh, largest natural gas exporter. We're taking into when taking into account both pipeline and LNG uh, exports, and it is a significant uh, uh, um, producer and uh, of uh, of coal, the third largest exporter of coal in uh, in global markets, and also important producer of critical minerals and agricultural commodities. So. It's a, it's a crisis that has an impact on global commodity prices in general. And so this sets, I think, the context to try to understand what are the implications for Latin America. And so I'm going to start, I think uh, it is uh, important to start with the macro implications. And then, so I'm going to turn to Mauricio, who is going to walk us through how he sees the macro impact in Latin America. Well, thank you, Luisa. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, hello, Juan Carlos. Uh, it's uh, fantastic that we're doing this together in live, in person here from Columbia University. So you're going to have to stop me because it's, it's such a big question. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to, to speak for maximum five minutes. So you really have to stop me um, on the macro consequences of the war in Ukraine for Latin America. If you read the newspapers, the, the front page of the newspapers in Latin America, this is about inflation. That's the main concern. That's really what is making the headlines. And uh, rightly so, because inflation has accelerated. It was already quite high before uh, the war, uh, but it's now even higher. Take the case of uh, Brazil, um, has increased from about 10% on an annual basis in December to uh, close to 11%. Colombia from 5.5% in December to 8% uh, now. So inflation has accelerated everywhere. Uh, talking about inflation, let's mention the case of Argentina, uh, where inflation has also accelerated from a very high 50% to about 56%. So all of this is because of what's happening in the markets of uh, food products, um, the uh, fuels market, and the fertilizers market. So all these things combined have had this type of impact. So that's the main concern. But then there is the expectation of a trade gain, uh, which is also quite important. And in order to understand the impact on trade, um, we have to look at the specifics of each country because some countries are net food exporters. So that means a net gain because they can also benefit from higher or price, uh, high food prices. That's the case, for example, of Argentina. That's the case of Paraguay. That's the case of Nicaragua. Um, uh, some countries are oil exporters. That's, of course, also the source of a net gain. But others are 
oil importers, mostly in the Caribbean and Central America, uh, and are also food importers. So there are countries that really have a significant loss associated uh, with this conflict. Add to this tourism, because tourism is also impacted uh, by the war, not just because of uh, Russian tourists, which are important. Uh, there are 3% of the tourists that arrive uh, yearly on the Dominican Republic. So it's not a small number. And of course, tourism is impacted whenever there is a war. It's not just the, the country that is experiencing the conflict. So to kind of like make sense of all these broad information and, and uh, differences in impacts, net gainers, mostly in South America, oil exporters, Venezuela can be a very significant net gain, uh, Colombia as well, um, net uh, uh, losers, uh, the Caribbean countries and, uh, and some Central American countries. Uh, the orders of magnitude, this is important, uh, about 2% of GDP uh, for a country uh, that is a net gainer, significant net gainer, like Ecuador or like Venezuela, slightly less, maybe 1% of GDP for a country like Colombia. And on the other side of the spectrum, losses of about 1.6% of GDP this year uh, through the trade channel in Central America and the Caribbean. Some countries will lose more. Panama, for example, is a huge importer of oil. The Bahamas, um, um, uh, Jamaica, all those countries uh, will lose more than 2% of GDP. So anyway, and finally, the financial channel. So um, the, the US dollar has strengthened um, and, uh, and that also means that uh, weaker currencies in, in the region, in some parts of the region uh, can, uh, can provide a gain in terms of exports. But the most important financial element is related to uh, spreads. Uh, spreads tended to increase uh, in the first weeks after the invasion, um, have stabilized somewhat. Uh, we are not seeing uh, the type of increase in spreads that we saw at the beginning of COVID, but we saw for a few days, we don't know how much this is gonna last, some significant outflows of capital, especially portfolio capital uh, from the region. So um, that's another effect uh, basically resulting from the flight to, to quality, to safe heavens uh, in terms of uh, turmoil and uncertainty. And one final element here is the um, impact of the conflict uh, on uh, investment. So investment is of course dependent on uncertainty and there are lots of uncertainty uh, right now. As we we're gonna discuss today, uncertainty is the word that perhaps better describes what's going on uh, in the global economy. So that certainly will have an impact on investment throughout the region. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Mauricio. As, as you mentioned, this seems to be not a clear cut uh, either benefit or, or loss, uh, it seems to be a much more nuanced uh, type of impact. And so that gets us, I think, to an, our next question, which is, so what does this mean for the energy transition? Does it slow it down? Does it accelerate? Uh, how is the region, how do you see Juan Carlos, the region faring, or at least Chile faring in this question, uh, which I think is very timely in the context of uh, the implications for global energy markets? Well, it's, it's great to be here face to face. And to see the audience face to face as well, students. Um, so I agree with you, it's, I think it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. It's hard to tell in part because we don't know how this invasion will end up and when it's gonna end up. Um, and it's hard to tell in part because different countries face different situations. So it might end up accelerating it somewhere and then slowing it down somewhere else. Uh, but generally I see uh, some things on the positive side and some things on the negative side. On the positive side, the most obvious one is, I think, uh, all over the world, but in Latin America as well, we are all now more aware than ever that we need to accelerate the deployment of renewable energies. I mean, people 
We have known this for a long time, <laughs> but now this is more evident than never. Uh, not only for environmental reasons, but for geopolitical reasons. We don't want to depend for transportation, heating industries and so on, on certain regimes that are autocrats and that our dollars are funding whatever they are doing. So we know that for sure. Now we had known that for a long time, but I think that it's more clear than ever before. Uh, the other thing that I, I see on the, on the positive side is that as prices of fossil fuels go up, the relative price of the alternatives are better in comparison, right? So if you are a company that is spending a lot of money in fossil fuels, oil, for example, diesel, these prices make the alternatives more competitive. So if you want to invest in energy efficiency, for example, that equation is much more convenient today than it was with lower prices. Uh, the energy, I mean, generation, renewable solar and wind look better with higher energy prices uh, driven by fossil fuels. So I think that can as well accelerate the transition into renewables. That could happen in transportation, for example. If you spend a lot of money uh, in transportation with your car, now might make more sense to move into electric vehicles and so on, okay? So that, those are the main things that I see on the positive side. But I also see a couple of things on the negative side. One is that we are uh, convinced that we want to move into renewables, but we are, I mean, this is very clear, we need fossil fuels in the short term to get out of the crisis. That will trigger or could trigger additional investments in infrastructure, for example, more storage capacity, more pipelines, more terminals. And the investors that will put the dollars into those infrastructure assets will reasonably want to recoup and get a reasonable return on those investments. And that could lock in our economies for a longer period of time into fossil fuels. So that's not good news. Uh, and the other thing I, I see is that as prices go up, and especially in a context of high inflation, as Mauricio was saying, governments all over the region are getting a lot of pressure from consumers to help them alleviate the impact of higher energy prices. Uh, and different countries are applying different policies, but overall they're putting some public money either to give subsidies or to reduce taxes. Uh, that makes sense in the short term, but we know that to accelerate the energy transition, we need to increase taxes on fossil fuels. We need to increase the carbon tax and so on. Uh, most of these measures are in theory transitory, short term, just for the crisis. But we all know that once you put a subsidy in place or you re reduce a tax, later on, those measures are very hard to revert. So if that is not designed in a proper way, that could again hurt the energy transition because we will have again, when prices go down, potentially in the future, lower taxes or higher subsidies that will again, make more difficult the transition from fossil fuels to renewables. So I think it's, it's hard to tell. If I were to summarize this, I would say the biggest challenge in Latin America, but I think all over the world is how do we navigate the short-term crisis in which we will need fossil fuels without putting in place measures, investments, or decisions that will have a long-term impact, negative impact on the energy transition? That's kind of how I see it. That's very interesting, Juan Carlos, and, and thank you for your comments on this. But you bring the issue of subsidies, which ends up being also a fiscal issue uh, uh, in the region, which already has fiscal deficits. And so how do you think about that, Mauricio? Absolutely. I think uh, what uh, Juan Carlos said is, is, is spot on. One of the legacies of this crisis that is going to make it harder for the energy transition is that energy subsidies are likely going to increase. They are, they are already increasing. So um, if you look at the conversation that is taking place in, in many countries in Latin America, um, the issue of uh, uh, fuel prices, gasoline, diesel, is also a central topic because governments are discussing how much to transfer of the increasing global prices to the domestic consumer. When and how, how to stabilize prices. Um, and, and this is not a minor issue, especially at a year where there are elections. There are elections in Colombia, there are elections in Brazil. Brazil. A new government was just sworn in in Chile. 
a government is about to fall in Peru. So, you know, the issue is very sensitive. Uh, and that means that, uh, that uh, it's not as simple as saying, well, uh, we're gonna transfer the increase in global prices to the consumer. That's not gonna happen. So who's going to take the bill? Who's going to pay? Um, you saw this week that the CEO of Petrobras uh, resigned or was forced to resign. And the central issue behind that decision was who is going to pay for this? Petrobras announced uh, earlier this month that they were going to increase um, uh, fuel prices. And of course that did not resonate well with the president. And, uh, and that was a source of the, of the change uh, in the administration because um, in Brazil, as has happened many times before, uh, the, the solution to these type of situations is to have a, a Petrobras take part of the bill. Contrary to Colombia, for example, in Colombia, Ecopetrol receives the international price for the fuels that it produces, but then the significant difference between what the consumer is paying and that international price is taken by the government, by the treasury. This year, just to have the order of magnitude, this is very significant. This year, these subsidies, energy subsidies, just to gasoline and diesel are estimated to cost 2.5% of GDP. 2.5% of GDP is a huge number, uh, especially in countries where public debt has increased as a result of the COVID situation and countries that are expecting also to reduce energy subsidies to accelerate the energy transition. So my, my um, view on this is that uh, we're gonna end up with a situation where taxing uh, fossil fuels and taxing carbon emissions are gonna be much harder as a result of the, of the invasion of Ukraine. And uh, we're gonna see something that is gonna stay there for years because uh, reducing these subsidies is not something you can do overnight because the consumers you know, essentially react uh, make it to the streets, uh, generate uh, social uh, uh, turmoil, and it's it's very hard to to reduce subsidies. So in this particular aspect, I I, I think uh, the energy transition is going to be negatively impacted as a result of these of these situations. Yeah, I agree. And so just, just one brief thing on that. So and the set of policies that should be implemented instead of those are right there on the table, right? So you should not be giving subsidies to everybody that is consuming fossil fuels. You can give, I mean, subsidies targeted. to the people, targeted subsidies to low income families, ideally to spend that money wherever they want. Yeah, but that's more complicated, it's more sure. nuanced. Why should we governments be subsidizing? I mean, diesel prices for people who are riding, I mean, expecting vehicles absolutely it doesn't make sense but it's and it's and hard to the, pull that the, off right? the reasonable thing to do under these circumstances is to be more selective to target better right. these subsidies which is exactly the opposite of what's happening yeah if you look at what's happening for example in peru peru is increasing now expanding the subsidy to the high octane gasoline uh which of course is is the is the type of gasoline that is purchased by the owners of the yeah. of the of the vehicles that uh, require the type of gasoline but anyway Luisa has a lot to say in this conversation. I'm gonna take a, here the role of asking questions because we want to hear from her. Um, as, as you all know, she's a renowned expert on all these matters. And the issue of, uh, of inflation, increases in prices, makes me think about one topic that we have not discussed, which is natural gas. If there is a price that has increased a lot, uh, is natural gas. If there is a commodity, that is at the center of attention in this conversation as a result of what's going on in Russia and Ukraine is natural gas. Um, so how is this situation, uh, the increases in, in, uh, in, uh, in prices, the, the need to increase the supply to uh, the European market, to diversify the sources and not have Europe so dependent on Russia, how is that impacting the natural gas market 
in our region, Luisa. Thank you so much, uh, Mauricio, for the question. This is a very, very relevant uh, question. Um, the region is not only a consumer of natural gas, it's also a producer. But one of the things that doesn't stop, uh, even if we're discussing how the speed of the energy transition, what doesn't stop is climate change. And so one of the things that the region is uh, unfortunately being affected by is uh, just the uh, rainfalls in general, which is affecting significantly the hydroelectricity or the constancy or the uh, reliability of, of hydroelectricity, which is the backbone of, uh, of the region's ge uh, electric generation. And one of the problems uh, with that is that I think the region has been extremely successful at uh, bringing uh, on, on the grid uh, renewable, non-hydro renewable uh, electricity, but hydroelectricity continues to be the base, uh, the, the, that's the base load for, uh, for, the, for the grid. Um, and so in the context of climate change, one of the things that became very obvious for Latin America last year uh, is that it, it also needed uh, to have secure supply of natural gas. The problem is that the region imports natural gas and the region is becoming a, a, an increasingly more important uh, importer of LNG. So as Mauricio just said, one of the issues here is how, uh, or one of the consequences or the outcomes of this, uh, of the Russian invasion to Ukraine is Europe's uh, uh, you know, decision uh, to diversify away from Russian natural gas. This is not easy. Uh, uh, it's 40% of uh, not only of Russia's uh, 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 exports of natural gas, it's, it's, it's a significant amount of what region uh, of what Europe consumes. Europe in general is the most important consumer market for both Russian oil and Russian natural gas. And so how is it that they're going to do this diversification? And there are not many places to go. One of them is the US, but guess what? Latin America has been has been increasing its imports of LNG from the U.S. last year. Uh, it was about 20 percent of total LNG it was almost two BCF per day. But during the months that were the most critical in the summer of South America, uh, Brazil, uh, Chile, and Argentina were pulling 30 percent of LNG uh, of LNG supply from the U.S. At a moment where uh, markets were extremely tight, uh, and guess what? They were not paying peanuts for this. Uh, one of the things that happens in natural markets is such a diversification of prices between piped natural gas and LNG natural gas prices. And so, you know, in the U.S., you have Henry Hub uh, prices, and that's, uh, you know, now it's five dollars per million of BTU. Last year, the average was four dollars per million of BTU. Well, if you are exporting that gas uh, through uh, uh, pipelines like like the Mexicans do, they they pretty much take forty percent of the um, of US natural uh, gas exports, but most of them are piped. And so it's $4 per million of BTU. But Brazil was importing LNG from the US at more than $30 per million of BTU last year. And so when you're looking at Brazil uh, and you're looking at Chile and you're looking at Argentina and they're importing at $30, $35 per million of BTU their LNG, guess what? The electricity price is determined by the marginal, uh, uh, by the most costly uh, uh, molecule that you put in the grid. And and that is LNG. And so that has led to a significant increase in electricity prices. So we're talking all here about fuel prices, but the consequence of, 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 uh, of this invasion as well, uh, in the context of very tight markets to begin with, is this issue of, uh, of uh, the increased uh, price in LNG and therefore in natural gas. And that's, for I, I think, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's something that is here to stay. Um, so, please. Well, this is this is very interesting. We could add the perspective of, of a specific countries, and let's add the perspective of Chile, which is a, net, a significant importer of LNG. So, but listening to Luisa, it's clear that we have the perception that Latin America is oil rich, but it's also natural gas poor in the sense that we don't produce enough natural gas, and we are importers of natural gas, with one very important exception, which is Trinidad and Tobago, right. which in the list of the net gainers. It's at the very top because Trinidad and Tobago not only produces natural gas and LNG, it also produces fertilizers. So it's really gaining. It's a, it's a, its impact is about three and a half percent of GDP this year, just as a result of the increases in in prices. But most other countries look. Maybe the case of Chile is also in the other direction and extreme uh, as as net losers because they're going to have to pay higher prices for the natural gas. So how is this? Uh, 
impacting the energy market, uh, consumers, uh, electricity generation, and the economy generally in Chile, Juan Carlos? So, so, so as you said, we don't produce natural gas. A little bit in Patagonia, just a little bit. So we import most of it, some through pipelines from Argentina. You remember we built seven gas pipelines several years ago, but Argentina is not delivering all the gas we could. It is actually it, importing a little bit. Net, it's importing. They, they have, Argentina has certain infrastructure restrictions to move the gas from Vaca Muerta, Neuquén to Buenos Aires, but that's a different story. Yeah. But we get some gas from Argentina through pipes, but that's seasonal, yeah. right? Uh, most of it we get LNG from the US and Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, we have long-term contracts. Um, so we are indexed to, to Henry Hub. So we're not hurting that much, uh, but when we need to buy additional quantities like in the spot market, we need to pay, I mean, higher, higher prices. Um, LNG, it's an important piece of the, our uh, power grid. So it's affecting electricity prices, but at, our drought has been there for like 12 years in Chile. So hydro generation, it's, it's, it's generating very little compared with historical numbers. So at some points during the day, it's diesel price that mm -hmm. is defining the marginal, the, not, the marginal price of, of electricity. But consumers have long-term contracts at fixed prices. So the ones that are hurting are generation companies that are buying electricity in the spot market to supply consumers, right? So companies are suffering the, the high sp spot prices. If you, I think the volume will be there because there are contracts and uh, in the short term. Now in the long run, if you think that Europe will try to reduce its dependence on Russian natural gas, they cannot do that today with LNG because they don't have enough regasification terminals as we know, but Germany and others are announcing new infrastructure uh, to import LNG from instead of getting the gas from Russia. Uh, that could eventually or potentially in the future displace gas that we are getting in Latin America from the US yeah. into Europe as, as Luisa was saying. So that's a, a, a source of concern in the medium and long run. But I don't see that happening in the short term. I think the short term, with the volume will be there. Hopefully, uh, the situation is more fragile, but I think it's going to be there. It's prices, and especially hurting uh, companies, generation companies. Um, that's more or less the situation in LNG. Um, and I think just maybe just one last thing. In the long run, one good replacement substitute for LNG, for gas could be green hydrogen. I want to think that in the long run, Europeans uh, will need green hydrogen. We have already working with them. And this crisis could potentially accelerate the, their uh, investments, maybe public funding to accelerate development of green hydrogen projects. That's not going to be the solution for the crisis. But in the long run, that could play a role. And Latin America has an enormous potential there as well. Um, but Luis, I think I want to come back to you again. <laughs> Because I think we, we need to talk about, about oil, right? So if we talk about oil, we talk about this crisis, and we talk about Latin America, we need to talk about Venezuela. You are Venezuelan. How do you see that dynamic play? So I think it's, it's always good to put numbers. Um, so I was mentioning in the introduction that Russia is the second largest exporter of oil uh, and petroleum products. We're talking about 7 million barrels per day between crude oil and petroleum products. It is second uh, to Saudi Arabia on crude exports. It is second to the US on petroleum product exports. So this is very, very difficult to diversify away from. Um, and so I think it's important to put those numbers because the discussion about Venezuela, uh, uh, I think, uh, has to be about what is it exactly that we're talking about. And so at the peak of oil production, Venezuela uh, was producing 3 million barrels per day pre-sanctions, so before uh, the recent uh, 2019 sanctions on the national company PDVSA, Venezuela was producing 1.5. Uh, so you know, this is not when we talk about Venezuela and we talked about we talk about, uh, you know, Venezuela as a solution, we just have to put things into numbers uh, uh, in order to understand what is it that we're talking about. And so um, in, in reality, 
uh, I think what this crisis has brought to the uh, to the forefront, and I think that two of you have mentioned this, is energy security. Uh, and energy security, both from the type of, uh, from the point of view of energy policy, how do you secure your energy supply? But also from the point of view of the exporters, how do you become a reliable energy supplier? So when thinking about Venezuela, who for a long, long time, it was an, a reliable energy supplier to the US, um, we have to think about uh, in the context of foreign policy, it, what are the conditions uh, in which you uh, 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 deal with sanctions that will convert Venezuela, that will bring back Venezuela, not only its oil production, but how do you create the conditions so that Venezuela becomes an, a reliable energy supplier in the future? And you were saying something that I think is extremely relevant. I think uh, this crisis is bringing to the forefront that um, that people are going to care or might care about what is it you're buying oil, what is the uh, seller of that oil doing with those revenues. And so there's something about an, the e, a concept that I know it's um, sometimes it has a, not the, the, the best uh, uh, explanation, but ESG barrels. And so it's not only about whether your barrel is uh, has low carbon emissions. So you want to get the, a low carbon emission barrel, but the S and the G component of the barrel. And so to me, this crisis is bringing a more holistic approach to both oil and gas. Uh, who, is, uh, who are you buying from? What are they doing with their revenues? And more of a, of a different kind of framework. Okay, so th that, that makes me think about a question for Mauricio. But before that, just to make sure I, get to, I got the numbers right. So how yeah. much is Venezuela producing today? Uh, right now, they're producing between 700 to 800,000 barrels per day. Okay. Uh, Pre-sanctions, they were producing 1.5. And the global market is? 100 uh, million? Uh, 100 million barrels per so day. So less than 1%. So that's yes. the size of Venezuela's yes. production, right? Okay. I mean, one caveat here is that Venezuela has uh, um, is believed, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, nuance and uh, uncertainty there, to have the largest uh, oil reserves outside of the Middle East. And it's even compared with Saudi Arabia, but the type of oil reserves in Venezuela are very heavy type of oil, uh, very heavy sulfur, not the very type of low carbon emissions type of oil. And so if you were to bring this to the market, you have to think about it in terms of uh, climate change and therefore in terms of how the Canadians are looking at their old Canadian sense of how do you significantly reduce the low carbon emissions? Uh, uh, if not, it's going to become a stranded asset, which was the concept that you were bringing. Okay. So Mauricio, so I think before this crisis, was, I think there was some consensus in the market. Uh, there was some reports out there that said that as the world was leaving fossil fuels behind and the demand was going down, we were going to move through what an economist would say a supply curve, right? Mm -hmm. And the more expensive producers want to be out of the market and the last man standing was going to be OPEC producers, the lowest cost producers. But this is saying Okay, guys, this is about price, but it's maybe also about what's the character of the government or the country that is behind those barrels. So how do you, is that hypothesis of the last man standing would be the cheapest one still true after what it's seen in Russia? Well, this is a, it's a, it's a fascinating question. I think it's a, it's a very difficult question to answer, but let me rephrase it because it's, a, it's so relevant. This is like prior to this war, we were worried about how we were going to reduce the production of oil, how we were going to reduce carbon emissions. And it didn't really matter who produced that oil. Um, now the question is, we need the oil and it's really important who owns it because those that own it can actually start wars and create a lot of turmoil. So, it's not just about uh, who produces at the lower cost. It's also about who produces in a reliable way or to use Luisa's words with strong ESG standards, um, who does it well. So prior to this war, it was believed based on the cost analysis that Juan Carlos just mentioned that Latin America was going to be among the producers of oil, the one with the sharpest decline as a result of the energy transition. So Latin America, just to give you order of magnitude, produced in 2019 about 10 million, slightly less than 10 million barrels per day. And it was expected, there's, a, there's there are papers on this and people have analyzed this, 
that by 2035, if we were serious about the 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius limit on global warming, that Latin America would take the largest reduction in oil production and it will come down to 4 million barrels by then. I now seriously doubt that that's gonna happen because the barrels produced in Latin America will be reliable and could provide energy security. This is very important. So why was the US government talking to Maduro, um, which talk, I think got everyone by surprise. I think that we're talking about the idea of increasing somewhat the production in Venezuela. And I learned this from a piece that Luisa just wrote at the Center on Global Energy Policy. It's a commentary which is increasing the production in Venezuela can go the wrong way because it can then benefit the joint ventures that the Russian companies have in Venezuela. Mm. But it could go the right way if it's the American companies that produce the type of oil that is needed by the US refineries in the Gulf. So it's tricky, but it's doable. It's doable. And I think that's still pretty much on the table, whether you can increase the production that is needed by well, through U.S. companies that it's needed by U.S. refineries. By the way, who produces uh, becomes an important issue. And I think it's no longer just the low cost producer. It's also the reliable ESG, et cetera, et cetera. And that, I think that speaks well of oil production in Brazil, in Colombia, in Ecuador, et cetera, et cetera. I think for the, mass, for the most part, Latin America would stand well in, in terms of providing energy security. Uh, Latin America is not gonna use this to start a war, that's the bottom line. I think, Lisa, on that on that point, I think today, mm -hmm. Russian, correct me if I'm wrong, but Russian oil is still flowing to the market. Yeah. And people are buying it at a discount of about $30 per barrel, so, more or less. So, yes. so there are still players that are willing to, I mean, to take it at a discount, so. No? At $100 so that, per barrel. You can, I mean, you can afford 30, right? Yes, you can <laughs> afford a 30% a uh, discount. I think one clarification in relation to what the, I totally agree with what Mauricio was saying is that I think the way to look at this and, and, and going to your argument is that when countries are sanctioned, um, and that has happened with Iran and uh, has happened with Venezuela, and you're right, Russian oil is not sanctioned. The US banned Russian oil, but it's not sanctioned elsewhere. Um, but it's, um, it's, it has a, a, a negative connotation and therefore it is fetching a significant discount. Regardless, they are sanctioned or not so great, uh, uh, not so value type of oil and that leads to a discount in the markets. Um, one thing that happens uh, in that context is that you start uh, to become uh, or you start to trade your oil through opaque uh, means. Um, and so transparency, which is such an important issue uh, nowadays, then uh, uh, really starts to, to suffer significantly. Um, one of the things about sanctions is that sanctions are supposed to change behavior. You, you put sanctions in order to elicit a change in behavior. So in thinking about if there's gonna be a rapprochement uh, with Venezuela, I, I really would advise uh, uh, to be purposeful about if you're going to ease sanctions, to do it in a way uh, that has a framework, a framework where you ask questions as, how does this improve the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela? How does this improve transparency? How does this improve human rights uh, uh, and democracy? Uh, but in general, you want flow to be, uh, you want oil to be flowing through um, transparent uh, channels through, you know, the right markets, and so that's why the distinction yeah. between the two, I think, makes uh, makes it's a it's that you cannot just do policy in a blanket, you know, yeah. in a you have to be look at the nuances. Even the nuances makes things not black and white. I, I mean, this nowadays you have to understand that things are not black and white, that the things are nuanced, uh, and uh, and the details are important. And and I guess in opaque markets, which is what you're saying, yeah. The ones who win are the ones who are willing to do things that other people are not willing to do. So, yes. so the final effect might be even counterproductive, yeah. right? And, so and, and um, you have to do the cost benefit. I mean, you may get 200,000 barrels that are necessary given the circumstances today, but you could end up also supporting another autocrat. And, and that's certainly not something uh, you want to do. So, I think the issue of the 
of the negotiations, conversations, whatever the outcome of that is, maybe nothing, maybe nothing is going to happen um, with Venezuela has to consider that element as well, that, that political element. So, and I think, why don't we open the floor for uh, questions uh, from the Good audience? Um, and so I think we have already uh, one, uh, yes, uh, could you please ask, the, why don't you take the mic and ask one of the questions that we have from the, our audience? No, no, no. Okay, we have, okay, we have a question for Francis, from Francisco Monaldi, my, my uh, co-author, co my co-author. Okay. Hi, Francisco, how are you? So uh, for Juan Carlos, how would high copper prices and left governments affect investment in this critical mineral for the energy transition? So, so say that again. It's uh, about high corporate prices and leftist governments affect this leftist oh, okay. government affect. <laughs> Easy yeah, question. So, so as you know, for those of you who don't know, but, but Chile is the biggest copper producer in the world by far. We produce 28% of the world's copper. The second one is Peru with 12. Okay. Uh, and copper is going to be very important in the energy transition. We need it for renewables, for electric vehicles, and so on. Um, so we have a lot of reserves as, as well. And so we need to, to attract more investment to keep our production high. Uh, there is a, I mean, broad consensus that demand for critical minerals will, will go up uh, through the energy transition. So higher copper prices, I mean, increase, let me put it this way, <laughs> increase the temptation of government to capture a bigger portion of the rents that come from mining. Uh, and that could hurt in the long run investment, right? So I think we have seen some signals of that in Chile. Uh, the lower chamber, the Chamber of Deputies approved a uh, first draft of a, of a royalty law that could hurt investment significantly. Uh, good news is that the Senate came up with a more reasonable uh, version of that. Uh, I think we're gonna, we're gonna have that discussion in Latin America. I think in Chile, we have some room to increase taxes for copper mines. But there are some voices, and that happens when prices are high, that are trying to capture too much a portion of the benefits because they don't have in mind that this is it's a cyclical business. Today, prices are high, but exploration is very risky. Companies must, I mean, survive the low prices and so on. So I think in Chile, and in the rest of Latin America, we're seeing a lot of pressure from governments, leftist governments, local communities that oppose mining for environmental reasons and so on. Uh, so we, the, I, I see a risk there, but I hope we can navigate this this successfully. Can, can I say a word, please, on on this issue of uh, minerals? Uh, because we we talked about uh, copper, coal. We we have not discussed coal. Coal is also one of those commodities that has increased in price as a result of the conflict it has actually increased more than any other mineral. Has, the price of coal has doubled. There's one very important producer, exporter of coal in Latin America, which is Colombia. And that impact is quite significant. It's, uh, that alone is about 1.7% of GDP. It's a huge number, it's, it's bigger than oil. And I think most Colombians will be surprised because the increase in the price in coal is larger than increasing the price of oil. So the net impact on, on Colombia's GDP is larger through coal than through oil. The question is, are these increases in coal prices going to help the energy transition or are they going to hurt the energy transition? Are they reflecting that the world is back to coal, that we're generating electricity again with coal because there is not enough natural gas that we need to diversify. So, you, you know, we bring back the coal into the scene or is this a short lived phenomenon that is just an opportunity to sell the coal at a higher price, but then we'll go back to the idea of basically shutting down the coal fire power plants. That's a big question. As you, as you had said, the Met, it's the, uh, the trade-offs between the short-term and, and right. long-term. Um, we have a question from Estel Castro. Hi, Estel, how are you? Um, how will you see political developments and elections in Colombia and later Mexico and potentially Brazil, depending on the results of the presidential election, will play into the reliability of Latin America crude exports in the future? So I think this was about the discussion that we were having about mm -hmm. how, you know, uh, the reliability and does it matter? Matter 
uh, the kind of uh, governments that uh, that exist in the region, um, because there are things that are happening in each of these countries. Uh, um, so Absolutely. Well, the, the short answer is yes. The presidential the presidential elections will matter because ideas matter, and candidates have different ideas about uh, what they want to do with uh, fossil fuels in general, with the oil sector in particular. Um, so, for example, in Colombia, there are clear options in that political spectrum, people that think that Colombia should not continue developing the oil sector, exploring new areas. And those that think that uh, Colombia is a poor country, that you know you have the issue of energy security, energy transition, but there is one that is even more important, which is energy poverty. And you have to deal with energy poverty. And the way to deal with it is to have the revenues to make sure that people are lifted out of poverty so that we need the oil rents to do that. So you have the whole spectrum. Whoever wins, I think that will have an impact on the actual policies. Um, and, uh, and certainly elections are very important in many ways. And this is one area in which is, uh, they are decisive. I want to add to what Mauricio is saying, because I think this crisis has also put into the uh, forefront that um, oil and gas, and particularly gas, uh, is a, uh, it's not only a transitional fuel, it is going to be a fuel that would enable the energy transition. So to think about that you, oil and gas, as as a zero-sum game, I think in Latin America, what I see is a lot of pragmatism about wh exactly what is the role of oil and gas uh, in the energy transition to finance it and to allow the conversion of oil and gas, uh, uh, the industry, uh, because it is going to the skills that they have, the kind of, kind of project finance that they have, the kind of capital deployment ability that they have is going to be instrumental in the mm -hmm. energy transition. I do not see the energy transition in Latin America without the oil and gas industry. I, I, very difficult to believe. This. Can I ask you a question in that regard to, to, yeah. to both of you, but you, yeah. uh, uh, you have been following this issue. So oil in the region is dominated by the NOCs, the national oil companies, uh, but they have been very focused on oil, producing more oil. Do you, do you think this will require a change in the way NOCs uh, uh, behave? Do you think NOCs should, I guess, prioritize, to use that word, natural gas? I think some of them are. Some of them are thinking, and national companies in general, and oil and gas companies in general, I think are starting to shift in their portfolio to more towards gas. I think that is happening. Uh, um, and I do think that in the region, it is about reliability, it is about energy security, but we'd love also to hear your thoughts on how you see the oil and gas industry in the energy transition, given Chile's very clear green path. So, so I think, I think in in the in the power sector, we will need natural gas for several several years. I mean, it's a very good combination with solar and wind. Especially, we have severe droughts that we have. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, but it will probably be. I mean, drier than it has been historically. So natural gas would be essential. The problem I see there, besides the one we have already discussed, is the public opinion. I mean, we all know here about energy and we talk about coal and natural gas, we understand the difference and so on. But most people think natural gas or gas is a fossil fuel, so we need to get rid of coal. We're phasing out coal uh, power plants, for example, but many parliament, I mean, congressmen say, if we're facing out coal, why don't we face out natural gas at the same time? And you need to explain that. You, we need to make the distinction to the broader population. That coal is one thing, oil is another thing, natural gas is a different thing. There are one, there is one company that's trying to build a new uh, natural gas combined cycle plant. That would be very good for our system. It could accelerate the phase out of coal, but it's very hard to get the approval the acceptance of local communities and so on. So I think natural gas will be there. We need natural gas and we need, we need to make that case more broadly to the broader population. So we have a series of questions. I'm going to ask all of them. And as we think about cl the closing thoughts, maybe we can each answer one of the questions. So the first one is, um, 
uh, what do you think about Guyana and Trinidad as fossil fuel providers in the mid in the midterm? Um, the other one, Francisco Goncalves, what is your opinion on oil product trade flows and in specific the risk of diesel shortages related to Ukraine war, specifically Latin America, especially Brazil, but also Argentina and Mexico is very are very short on diesel, and most of that comes from the US. With Europe most likely pulling in those flows from US Gulf Coast, Europe also gets significant diesel supplies. So diesel supply uh, in, in Latin America. Um, the other one, uh, how do you see the impact of ammonia and fertilizer supply in the region, given its reliance on these products for food production and ammonia needed for industrial production? We, we touch upon the fact that Russia is a very important producer of ammonia. Yes. Um, China's dominance uh, of the mineral supply chains that will be needed for the energy transition is raising energy security concerns, particularly in the U.S. Um, so engagement of the U.S. in Latin America on the critical min mineral side. So why don't you answer that one? And the, you, we can, there's us also, what are the implications of the current oil price environment for Mexico and AMLO's energy strategy? So, let, me, let me start with, with critical minerals because we have had a couple of discussions about this in, in the last couple of days. So I think it's important that we all understand that we cannot have an energy transition without mining, right? So I, I like to think about it this way. We can stop climate change or we can stop mining, but we cannot stop both, okay? And I say this because there is a lot of people who are very vocally arguing in favor of renewables of the energy transition and so on. And then they oppose mining. So copper, lithium, nickel, cobalt, and so on are essential for the energy transition. We don't have time to get into the details, but without those minerals, there's no energy transition, no electric vehicles, and so on. So and Latin America has a lot of, of, of minerals. So it can be a great opportunity for Latin America as well. I think the challenge we have as, uh, in the mining industry is first, how do we make this case more broadly so that people understand that mining is essential to stop climate change? And secondly, which is very important, companies, mining companies, need to reduce their own carbon footprint and their environmental impact because they cannot be supplying the minerals that are essential for the energy transition and at the same time be a big source of emissions. So they need to replace, I mean, electricity contracts that are based on coal into renewables, and they are doing that in Chile. They need to reduce their use of fresh water using desalinated water. They're doing that as well. They need to replace diesel that they burn in their tracks with hydrogen or batteries and so on. But we need to keep mining. We need to attract investment in mining. Otherwise, that could become, I think, one of the uh, bottlenecks of the energy transition. I think that is very important to understand. Oh, but I'm going to take the question on uh, Suriname and Guyana. Perfect. That sounds good. OK, so yeah, these are two very important um, oil producers or countries that are expanding their oil product production and going to increase oil production in the next few years. Uh, Guyana has also a, an important side effect of this war, which is uh, it's a very important gold producer. 70% of the GDP in Guyana is gold. So as you all know, gold prices have also increased as a result of, these, uh, of this war. So these are two countries that are going to be adding uh, barrels to global production. Uh, in the next uh, in the next few years, they're already doing so. Uh, so far, more Guyana than Suriname, but Suriname is going to do it. Um, and I think this is uh, this is essentially the type of oil that uh, that provides the type of uh, energy security uh, for for this uh, continent, this hemisphere. So my my sense is that this production will take place and will be quite welcomed. Um, now. The, the question is, is that going to be well spent? Because we're talking about such huge numbers for these very tiny economies. And that's, that's really uh, the issue that we need to work in now, because we need to make sure that, um, that these uh, resources are, are saved and are well invested. And I'll use this as, as an argument to make the case that Today, the region, the oil producers in the region, the copper producers in the region, the coal producers in the region are making a windfall. Uh, we should all be thinking about ways of saving that windfall to invest in the energy transition. I think at the macroeconomic level, that's what we ought to do rather than go now and spend all that money or use that money to pay for the gasoline subsidies. 
That would be the wrong thing to do uh, with these windfall that we're receiving uh, as, a, as a side effect of these uh, 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 otherwise quite uh, devastating and, uh, and, uh, and, and horrible conflict. So I, I want to add to my colleagues uh, a final thought that comes from one of the questions that has to do with Mexico and AMLO's energy strategy. Um, I think one of the things that the conflict has also brought to the attention is the idea that energy transition is not only because it's the right thing to do because of climate, it's, an, it's a security issue and it's an affordability issue. The price differential that we're seeing in Latin America with electricity generated from solar and wind has nothing to do with what we're seeing from natural gas and fossil fuels. And so there is a just an obvious uh, case now from the point of view of energy security and in energy affordability. And so when you're thinking as a policymaker and even as a company, uh, uh, what is it that, that uncertainty and volatility mean? Is that you have to build resilience and resilience means diversification. So from the point I, I in, in thinking about energy policy, and I think this conflict also brings to the attention the links between energy policy and economic policy, you have to be sure that you need a, uh, 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 a diversified supply and thinking about the future, what is going to be the most reliable and the cheapest uh, uh, energy supply. And I think it's a lesson for Mexico uh, because we, we, and this also brings the point of, uh, of financing. Uh, uh, and we, Mauricio and I wrote uh, this commentary uh, uh, on uh, financing in the energy transition in Latin America. And to us, uh, there is significant amounts of money. Um, it is about the right policy framework. It's, uh, I, I've not seen a moment where uh, uh, respect for property rights, uh, for rationality, for pragmatism, for understanding how to combine energy security with energy affordability, oil and gas with renewables, a pragmatic approach going forward to me is gonna be key also for attracting uh, uh, financing for the energy transition. Can I drop just one, two, two please, numbers please. of what you just said? Yes. So we just, we run these tender processes in Chile to secure electricity, to supply electricity, to regulate the climate. In the last we run, I think it was in November, the cheapest offer we got 24 seven was 13, one, three dollars per megawatt hour. Okay. And the marginal price when we burn diesel is at these diesel prices over $250. Per megawatt hour. So 13 renewable to 250. That's the difference. Okay, now we need to combine solar with, with LNG or with gas yes. and storage and so on. But the point I think it's very important the energy transition and renewables can be also good business, <laughs> right? For consumers and for companies. It's not only about the environment because there was this vision that is either the environment or affordability or the economy. Renewables today with the technology are both things at the same time, which is good. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here with us. We really appreciate it. And to you uh, in the uh, watching us uh, live, uh, thank you so much for your questions. And uh, we are, the three of us are at the Center on Global Energy Policy. You can reach out to us uh, and uh, ask any questions that we were not able to uh, cover. Thank you and, uh, um, and good afternoon. Thank you, guys. Thank you.